So we've been talking about this whole situation with the NBA, with North Carolina, and I wanted to get a perspective of how this is going to affect things business-wise, legally. So I thought the best person to bring on would be somebody who knows a lot about this stuff. She works for CNBC as a sports business and legal analyst, also for the Huffington Post. Her website is rulingsports.com. Alicia Jessup, she also is a professor at the University of Miami. So if you know she's from the University of Miami, she's got to be good, right, Alicia? I like that. Yes, it's all about the U. (laughs) So on a little more serious note, so give me your immediate reaction when you heard this news about the NBA pulling the All-Star game out of Charlotte. So my immediate reaction might surprise some people. I thought yesterday was a really interesting day in the world of basketball because on one hand you have the NBA taking a pretty progressive stance with removing Charlotte's right to host the All-Star game next year in 2017. But yesterday you also had WNBA players who on average make about $70,000 being fined $500 a piece um, from three teams for wearing black warm-ups in support of the Black Lives Matter movement, and then those three teams also being fined $5,000. And so as I think about this more and more, um, there's a lot of people saying that the NBA is becoming this social influencer who is exercising its power to change the course of the way that America looks and the way that it reacts and Um, makes decisions in certain situations. But the more I think about it, the more apparent it becomes to me that the NBA is willing to take a stance on matters that directly impact its bottom line. Um, And and another example I have for that is the Clippers. So if we remember the Donald Sterling incident a couple years back, the Clippers players, to my memory, you know, I'm just going off my memory here, the first game after that whole scandal broke, they came out onto the court with inside out jerseys. Yep. So you couldn't see the Clippers logos and those men weren't fine. And so I'm seeing a trend here where if it's something that directly relates to the NBA, the NBA itself or its players are allowed to speak on it, but arguably Black Lives Matter and that movement don't directly impact the NBA, so we see the WNBA players being fined. It's it's an interesting line that's being told. Do you think that ultimately, overall, that this whole situation with North Carolina, what do you think is going to be the legal ramification? Because I don't know if Charlotte or North Carolina has any legal recourse, but is there potentially something down the road where someone may say, you know, listen, you guys aren't really functioning as a, you know, an equal opportunity individual when it comes to the WNBA, to the NBA, with ownership, with how you allocate the All-Star game? Well, there, there's not room for an equal opportunity claim based upon this situation. Any matter that would arise legally would be a contract-based claim. And unfortunately, I'm not privy to the contract that the NBA entered into with Charlotte, North Carolina in 2015, granting Charlotte the right to host the All-Star Game. But what I do know about these types of contracts is they include a bunch of different types of clauses that give entities like the NBA in this case, or for instance, the NFL, Major League Baseball, et cetera, ways to get out of the deal. And so knowing how the NBA works, again, we can go back to the Donald Sterling example when Adam Silver fined him and banned him for life from the NBA and then asked for the owners of the 30 teams to begin the process to remove him. What what I saw from that is this is a man who does have a law degree and who follows the rule of the law before making decisions. And so my hunch is that the NBA's legal counsel, both inside and outside of the league, read over that contract to make sure that they could legally get out of the deal and take away the All-Star game from Charlotte. We're talking with Alicia Jessup. You can follow her on Twitter, at Ruling Sports. I want to ask you about the business side of this, because I think that's the side that is a little bit getting mixed messages here. So... Apparently, officials in North Carolina are claiming this is going to be a $100 million loss 
for their economy, while other people are claiming that this is not a overall economy issue, that this is an employment issue, a bunch of people with part-time jobs would lose working hours. I want to ask you, you know, can you can you you know, give us a little bit of you know clarity about what is true and what is not in all this? Sure. So I'll get to the one hundred million dollar figure in a second, but the first place that we have to go to when analyzing the economic consequences of this decision is we have to go back in history to 2014 when the city of Charlotte, so its city council, approved roughly $27.5 million of renovations to the Hornets Arena that would be funded by taxpayers largely. So the renovations, again, $27.5 million, were part of a $33 million upgrade plan for the arena. When arenas engage in this type of renovation, the main plan behind that decision is to garner the attraction of the ability to host major events, in this case, the NBA All-Star Game. So that legislature was approved in 2014, and then in January 2015, Charlotte was awarded the game. So from a taxpayer perspective, you know, I'm arguably more okay with the fact that perhaps some sort of tax against me is increasing because I believe that there's going to be a positive economic impact by my city hosting this game. Now, when we hear about events like the All-Star Game, the Super Bowl, WWE's WrestleMania, we oftentimes hear these astronomical valuations thrown out for how much economic impact they're going to bring to the host city. And Um, I've been covering sports for five years and these type of stories. The number I hear pretty much every time is somewhere between 75 and $150 million. There are academic scholars who greatly dispute those numbers. They say that they're very, very, very highly inflated. But what we do know is these types of events bring tens of thousands of people into a city who otherwise would not be in that city that weekend. Those people are renting cars, they're staying in hotels, they're eating at restaurants, they're purchasing souvenirs, and that drives economic impact for the city. So Charlotte is certainly going to take an economic hit due to its inability to host this event because of the NBA's decision. How that's quantified is debatable, but I would argue that the devaluation here is bigger than just that weekend because now people who may not have been paying attention to this law that was passed in North Carolina who might be NBA fans or fans of some of the musical artists who have refused to play in the state such as Bruce Springsteen and Ringo Starr their eyes are open to this issue and if they disagree with the law too they might withhold traveling to North Carolina or more specifically Charlotte. I want to ask you as well, just kind of follow up on that. You know, you mentioned the, the people coming into the state. You know, we always hear, like you said, these crazy numbers, you know, about WWE and the UFC and all these different special events that come to different cities that seem to take over the city for a few days and the financial impact that these events have. And I'm, I was just curious, you know, with the NFL moving the Pro Bowl and the NBA circulating all-star game from city to city every year and so does baseball and hockey I want to know is it a consistent financial boom that happens for these cities or is it one of those things where it really depends on the event and it really depends on the city that they go to it really depends on the event and the city Um, the NBA all-star game tends to sell out it tends to have a big following regardless of where it is, the same goes for the Super Bowl. I think another example, though, that we have to look at is college sports. So cities every year put up big fights for the right to host college bowl games. And so those of us who are college football fans, we know that every year more and more bowl games are put on the list of college football bowl games. Not every single one of those necessarily generates a huge economic impact that is promised from the get-go. So, you know, when, when you have a bowl game where the matchup doesn't necessarily have the most eye-popping teams or the greatest competition, or perhaps it's in a city that a lot of people don't want to travel to or it ends up being very far away from the teams that are playing and where they're located, you could run into some economic problems. And the thing that everyone has to keep in the back of their minds is, these cities are shelling out hand over fist in money 
for the right to even be considered as host sites. And to me, I think that's the biggest issue in this conversation about the North Carolina law and the NBA pulling out of the 2017 All-Star Game is these taxpayers invested in roughly $28 million worth of arena upgrades that they thought were going to lure in great events that get people like you, me, and your listeners to hop on an airplane and go to Charlotte for a weekend. Now, this law is counteracting against that. And so if I'm a taxpayer, I'm saying, well, shoot, was it worth it? We're talking with Alicia Jessup. You can follow her on Twitter at Rolling Sports. She's a sports business and legal analyst for CNBC and the Huffington Post. You talked about college sports, which is exactly where I wanted to go next. Uh, the ACC has announced they're still going to have their college football title game in North Carolina, despite recent events and with the law. So do you think that is going to be a kind of like a measuring stick about how impactful negatively or positively this is going to be for future sporting events? Yeah, so the NCAA is kind of its own animal, right? The NCAA and then the conferences that are members of the NCAA. And what we have to realize is that the ACC is headquartered in North Carolina. So that might play into the decision as well because the argument is, well, how can we be headquartered in this state and be okay with running a non-for-profit business operation out of it, but we can't be okay with this law that's passed within our borders. So it'll be interesting to see if other people follow the NBA's lead, and by people I mean other business entities or sports leagues and operations, um, and maybe other musical acts and entertainers. But as time goes on, I think we're losing sight of what the focus should be on and what the real issue is at stake is whether or not this law is actually valid. You know, I, I don't hear a lot of people talking about that. What I hear people talking about is, did the NBA make the right decision or not? And, and so I think as a society, we have to have a bigger conversation about the rights that transgendered people have in our country. Real quick, before I let you go, I wanted to transition a little bit and ask you about the sale of the UFC because that $4 billion figure is still hanging around. I still get people asking me about how on earth is, you know, we know they're the largest mixed martial arts organization on the planet, but for them to get $4 billion, what does it say about the value of bigger sport entities like the NFL and the NBA? It says that the value of those entities are huge, but here's how the UFC gets to a $4 billion valuation when its owners purchased it for $2 million. I wish I had $2 million to buy it because you wouldn't be talking to me today. I'd be on my own private island if I just got $4 billion. But the, the UFC sold to what the UFC did because it had the foresight to turn itself into a media mogul. We are living in a highly digital age where media rules and runs the day. We can see that in the presidential election right now and what both candidates are doing through social media and the digital space. But UFC, I would argue, more so and better than any of the four major leagues, so the NBA, NFL, so on and so forth, utilize media, really starting with the Ultimate Fighter TV show. So I'm not a UFC fan, you know, I, I don't like violence, so I can barely sit through a fight, but I used to watch the Ultimate Fighter because it was captivating, it was engaging, the fighters were kind of interesting characters, and that really captivated a pretty wide audience of Americans and people abroad, and then the UFC just kept building upon that media platform and where I think it really drove up its valuation was through its app. You know, when we look at how much time people spend on their smartphones, I read a study a while back that said something like 68% of Americans say that having a smartphone is similar to having air and water and food. Okay, so they rank it up with those essential things to live. And when you see how much time people are spending on their smartphones, if you are not disseminating app based data, 
and digital information, you are going to lose. If you are, it's a great way to create a higher value for whatever your brand is. I really appreciate you joining me, Elisa Jessup. You can follow her on Twitter at Ruling Sports. Her website is rulingsports.com. She also does work with CNBC and the Huffington Post. And she's also a professor at the U, the University of Miami. Yes. We're so, going to be good this year. Yeah, good listen, football coming your way. There, there's a lot of people. Listen, I don't, I don't know if Kafka is the best quarterback in college football, but he's got enough years under his belt that he's going to be a lot better than probably half the conference. Yes, and, you know, Mark Rick has really changed the culture of this football program. I, I teach a lot of football players, and they're this new, there's a new attitude. Um, you can just sense that they feel relieved, they're happier, they're excited, they're ready to compete, and they feel like champions. So I'm really excited to see what they do on the field this year. Listen, you just made me excited because I'm a huge U fan. So Yes. <laughs> um, this is awesome. <laughs> Uh, I guess yeah, I have to have you on during college football season then, right? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, enjoy the rest of your weekend. I appreciate you joining right. me today. Thank you. Take care.